praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, all you people, every nation shout his praises. For so great, yes, so magnificent, has been the loving kindness he has shown to us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting, give the Lord all praise. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting, give the Lord all praise. Greetings and felicitations. I would like to thank you and welcome you to this video. This video is dedicated to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now what I'd like to do in this video is do two parts. The first part I would like to do is an overview of all the points that I have made in my previous videos. Showing you the forest, for example, rather than the individual trees. In my previous videos I was just centering on the individual trees, but now I'd like to take a look at the whole forest. And in doing so, I, I think, I, I hope that I will show you that what Dr. White has embraced, what Dr. Wallace has embraced, what Dr. Uh, Carson has embraced, and many other evangelical theologians have embraced, is a false philosophy. Dr. White, uh, I'm uh, specifically looking at him because he's the one who's most vocal in these things. Now, he's, um, he is also a victim of his own word. Uh, the word is draw ray, the dogmatic repetition of already refuted errors. And um, uh, the theory that Dr. White is promoting in his book uh, was first promoted by Westcott and Hort. Back in the 1800s, there arose what, uh, what I'll call a scientific mentality, a mentality that is essentially um, rationalistic in nature, and uh, they had this bold confidence that um, the scientific method can answer all questions. That uh, as, as long as we apply the scientific method, this rationalistic understanding, we can determine the truth in any matter whatsoever. The most famous of these, uh, sci of this use of the scientific method is evolution. And when you take a look at the evolutionist and the creationists, the evolutionists look down at the creationists because the creationists are not scientific. They are not using the scientific method the way the evolutionists want them to use. And in the same fashion, right, the modern textual critic is looking down at um, men like Bergen and Scrivener, and, uh, and even though they may have some respect for them, and uh, Hill and Ledis and others, who uh, want to, and I probably myself, and who, who want to um, promote the... Uh, the reformed view of textual criticism, uh, rather than a rationalistic view, they look down on uh, such scholars as, uh, and I'm not calling myself a scholar by the way, but um, they look down on these scholars and they, they, they say that because they're not using our method of, um, because they don't accept our views, uh, therefore they're not really scholarly. That is not the case. Right? Um, the reformed scholars all right, are um, are burdened, if you want, with Reformed theology. In other words, Reformed theology informs their textual criticism, and uh, w rather than the other way around. The uh, idea of a rationalistic uh, approach determines what the Word of God is. The Reformed theologians are the ones who receive the Word and then seek to find the, uh, the, the reasons why. Um, and that's the difference between, um, there's a, actually a two-word difference between the, uh, the modern textual critic and the reformed critic, as, as far as I can see it. The modern textual critic wants to use a rationalistic understanding and determine what the word of God is, what the original autographs originally said. Um, reformed theologians receive the word and then they argue their points. And thus the Reformed te textual critics are at a disadvantage. They're not neutral in the sense that they, you know, they're, they're using a uh, philosophy, a theology, Reformed biblical theology, in order to inform 
their textual criticism as a means of receiving the Word of God from God. So using God's doctrine to determine God's Word is the, uh, is the Reformed view. To use man's reason to determine the, uh, the, uh, the original, what the original autograph said is the false philosophy. And this false philosophy has many points to it, many rationalistic points to it. And uh, Dr. White has fallen into this problem. And many other theologians have. You know, B.B. Warfield is a good example of a person who has been, uh, who's been enticed into the idea that, um, that, um, that uh, modern textual criticism is the, is the right way to go. Now, when it comes to these uh, orthodox theologians, men like Dr. White, Dr. Wallace, I'm including him, though I don't know really his theology, um, Dr. Carson, who's orthodox, and, uh, and others as well, um, they're orthodox in certain areas, and they are not orthodox when it comes to textual criticism. I call this the St. Augustine syndrome. Um, St. Augustine, one of the most powerful theologians of all time, and in, in one sense, uh, many people say that since St. Augustine, um, all theology is simply a set of footnotes to his works. Now, St. Augustine was orthodox when it came to his soteriology, when it came to his understanding of salvation, uh, when it came to the idea of the Trinity, of the deity of Jesus, when it came to uh, predestination, when it came to the gospel itself. St. Augustine preached orthodoxy and Reformed theology and Biblical theology. His, his work is right on target and you can't dispute that at all. And, uh, and for that reason many Protestants really, really uh, appreciate St. Augustine in his, in his writings. Um, the other hand, um, when it came to ecclesiology, the study of the church, that is the office and the formation and the, uh, the uh, the structure of the church, St. Augustine was patently Roman Catholic. He believed in the Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the uh, priests, the whole thing concerning prelacy can be found in the writings of St. Augustine. And because of that, the Roman Catholics love him. So the Protestants say, okay, St. Augustine is on our side, and the Roman Catholics say, no, St. Augustine is on our side. And this is the St. Augustine syndrome. If such a heavy theologian as um, St. Augustine, and uh, I'm arguing what the Hebrews call from the heavy to the light, if he can be orthodox in some areas and unorthodox in other areas, what does that say about us? I mean, what does that say about men like J.I. Packer, R.C. Sproul, um, Dr. White, um, Dr. Carson, and all these men? They can be uh, very orthodox in certain aspects of their understanding of, for instance, soteriology. And yet they can be very much off in other aspects of uh, Christian doctrine, such as textual criticism. So I'm not indicting Dr. White in his uh, orthodoxy. I believe that he is very orthodox, and many of the things that he says concerning King James Onlyists, I agree with as well. All right, I don't agree with the King James Onlyists when they start saying that the King James Bible is the autographs. And that's uh, Stephen Anderson, that's um, uh, Gip, that's all those guys that you'll see at the, um, the John Ankerberg show uh, on the uh, King James Only side, Gail Ripplinger, um, you know, all of them are, uh, are holding that the uh, King James Version is the autographs. I don't believe that. I believe that the autographs uh, passed away maybe after the first or second century. We don't have any more the autographs anymore. But what you can find is you can find the autographs, the very Word of God, in the copies that we have. Right? And not only the copies, the manuscript copies, but also the printed copies as well. Because the printed copies, starting around the 1500s or so, started supplanting the manuscript copies. Right? So the Textus Receptus, in my opinion, is the closest thing that we have to the autographs. Stevens, 1550. That's my point. That is what I believe, and that is what I will defend. Now, I'm not going to say that Stephen's 1550 is perfect, but I will say that it is the closest text that we have to the autographs, and therefore it is the one that the church should be using 
when it translates the Bible, when it uses the Greek to uh, read the Bible, and to expound on the Bible, etc. The critical text which came about in the 1800s is the result of a false philosophy. Now this false philosophy I'm going to point out in part one. In part two of this video I'm going to point out um, what it is to be reformed in textual criticism. What are the reformed views concerning textual criticism? So let's take a look at the forest. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on the, uh, on the screen the point that Dr. White makes, the points that refute Dr. White's, uh, the, the answers that refute Dr. White's point, and uh, maybe do a little expounding on them. But you'll see uh, firsthand his point, the reference to that point, and the answers that have refuted this. And Dr. White, you are a, even though you're consistent in your reform, in your textual criticism, your textual criticism itself is not consistent with reformed theology. And that is what I'm showing. So you are inconsistent when it comes to reformed theology. However, within the philosophy of modern textual criticism, you are consistent. And so here, we'll take a look at the forest and each point uh, that shows that, um, that uh, this is a false philosophy that you have embraced and that you are committing the error of Drare, the dogmatic repetition of already refuted uh, errors. Thank you very much and enjoy. Okay, the first uh, point that I made in my presentation was that the so-called Alexandrian manuscripts are older and therefore more authoritative. That's the point that Dr. White makes in uh, many of his videos in his books uh, everywhere. He just about says this uh, constantly in order to beat people down and show them that the older manuscripts should be considered uh, more authoritative. There are many reasons why we should consider the older manuscripts as not being more authoritative. Uh, in the beginning of this video, I produced uh, three uh, quotations. Uh, the first one was from a majority text man, Pickering. The second one uh, was from a critical text man. And the third one was from a Textus Receptus man, Bergen. And um, in all three of these uh, quotations, they're pointing out that the older manuscripts are not necessarily the better. This is a unified argument that uh, goes across all three spectrums, the majority, the critical, and the textus receptus. Uh, we'll, we'll all say that the older manuscripts are not more authoritative. Here are some of the reasons why, and you can look at my first video to find all the scholarly information for this. The first one is that the so-called Byzantine manuscripts are as old as the Alexandrian. And I pointed this out with some quotations from uh, Dr. Metzger, Bruce Metzger, as well as Dr. Gunther Zuntz. And Dr. Gunther Zuntz is not saying it's just the readings. Uh, that's one of the arguments against this point, is that uh, all we're looking at are the readings. Dr. White authoritatively uh, quotes uh, Dr. Wallace as saying in one of his footnotes <clears throat> in his book that the uh, that uh, all we're talking about are just uh, a, a few readings. But um, Gunther Zuntz is saying that the vast number of readings, of Byzantine readings that you're finding in these Alexandrian manuscripts are actually saying that um, the Byzantine uh, scribes are copying from an older textual tradition. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the first point. The second point, uh, is that the Alexandrian manuscripts come from only one area and a very limited area of the Christian church at the time, i.e. Egypt. That is, you're only going to find the Alexandrian manuscripts in Egypt. And uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, Dr. White talking about the text exploding. But uh, here, um, we don't find any evidence of Alexandrian manuscripts, for instance, in uh, Greece or in Germany 
or in Ireland or in Spain or anywhere else. Um, they all come from this very limited area of the Christian church in Egypt. And uh, this goes to this, the third point as well, is that no autograph of scripture was ever written to the Egyptians. The Alexandrian church did not have the originals. They had copies of the originals, copies that were made either in the first or the second century when copies were being made more abundantly. But um, for one reason or another, they did not have, there was no letter of Paul to the uh, to the to the Alexandrians. There's no letter of Peter to the Alexandrians in the Bible. And uh, therefore, um, they had copies, and these copies may have already been flawed. So that puts a question as to whether or not these Alexandrian manuscripts are really real. Um, the fourth point is that the Byzantine, so-called Byzantine manuscripts, are located in those cities where we would expect to find the autographs. That is, in Rome, in Corinth, in Galatia, Ephesus, Antioch, Philippi. These are all areas in the Christian church that are called Byzantine, and these are where the Byzantine manuscripts are found. And the argument is, is that wouldn't the churches that actually hold or held the originals, wouldn't they be the ones who would be able to recognize what the original reading was or not? Uh, so that, that gives you a question. In all of this, we see that the Byzantine manuscripts are on the same par as the Alexandrian manuscripts when it comes to ancientness. And the Byzantine are probably even superior to the Alexandrian because of this very issue, that the Byzantine churches were the ones who had the originals. And therefore, the copies of the copies of the copies would be closer in Rome or Galatia, or Ephesus, than it would be in Alexandria. Um, the answer five. Uh, here's a quotation from Dr. White's King James Only Controversy, uh, uh, verse, um, page 77. By having the New Testament in particular explode across the known world, <clears throat> there is no evidence that the Alexandrian form of the New Testament exploded across the known world. The opposite is the fact. The Byzantine manuscripts exploded across the known world, especially after the time of Diocletian and the Diocletian uh, controversy concerning the destruction of the uh, Christian manuscripts uh, between uh, three, uh, circa 300 or so. And the Alexandrian form are simply revisions of the Byzantine text that were done in Egypt. Um, the original copies from the Byzantine churches would go down to Alexandria. And apparently the Alexandrian scholars in probably the library there uh, edited the text and edited it according to their views. Dr. White's comments here are unrealistic. Egypt or Alexandria does not comprise the whole of the known world. Uh, verse answer six to this point. Most of the variations of the New Testament were accomplished around the year 200 AD. Thus, the older manuscripts may not be the most accurate if their pedigree is not ascertainable. Now, in some, in the Sinaiticus, uh, the uh, pedigree is ascertainable. This, the Sinaiticus came from origin, and there's proof of that in the Sinaiticus copy of the book of Esther, where it says that the book was copied out of the library of origin for his uh, for his uh, best student, Pamphilus. So uh, an origin was a known corrupter of manuscripts, but we'll look at that at a little later. So that those are, that's the first points. The first point is, is that the older manuscripts are not better than the younger manuscripts. That the older manuscripts are, uh, are actually show signs of corruption but from origin and others as well. They show signs of editing by the Alexandrian uh, scholars down in the library of Alexandria area. And uh, they are on the same par as the Byzantine manuscripts. And this is one of the reasons why I say 
that all of the manuscripts fall under one tree and not these several trees. There is not an Alexandrian or a Byzantine or a Caesarian or a Western text. They are all under one roof. They are all under the or originals. Now, the Byzantine, I believe, are closer to the originals than the Alexandrian. And, uh, but just because the manuscripts, the physical manuscripts of the Alexandrian are older, it doesn't mean that they are more authoritative. And I have given you the reasons why that is so. So we'll look at the next point in a, in a second. Too. Second point that we have here is the idea of conflation. The argument against the Byzantine manuscripts is that it is a conflated manuscript that it has lots of conflations in it and therefore uh, can't be considered uh, a legitimate copy of the originals. Now conflation, what you have in conflation, and I explain it better in my, uh, in my video, but uh, what you have is you have two texts and each text says something slightly different than the other. And uh, according to the theory, the scholar or the scribe has these two texts in front of him and he's not sure which one is the original. So he decides to conflate them. He, he decides to bring them both together and create a third reading that is supposedly the Byzantine reading. And uh, because of this, they argue that uh, the Byzantine manuscripts have to be uh, a lot younger and farther away from the originals because uh, it's a conflation rather than an actual uh, reproduction of the original of a copy of the original. Um, the answer is against this. The first one is that of the 7,400 plus verses in the Bible, only 49 of these verses have been found to be considered conflated. Uh, if that's the case, then, you know, you can't really say that all of the Byzantine readings are conflated if you only can find 49 verses. But it gets worse than that. Uh, second answer, it does not necessarily follow that these verses are conflated. These uh, verses may actually be the original reading, and the 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 differences in other texts may actually be found as editors shortening the originals. It may be that the Alexandrian editors were shortening the originals for sake for the sake of brevity, for reasons of their own. They may be shortening the text, and the Byzantine manuscript may actually be the original. Um, the third answer of these 49 conflated verses, only about seven to 13 are found in the Byzantine manuscripts. Um, if you consider there are over 5,000 plus Byzantine manuscripts and you can only find 13 conflations at most, uh, how can then the Byzantine manuscript be considered a conflated text or predominantly conflated as, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carson likes to pejoratively say. Uh, the vast majority of the 49 are Alexandrian in nature. Uh, these longer readings are most probably the original readings. That is, the longer readings found in the Byzantine manuscripts are most probably the longer readings. And what you're finding is editing done by the Alexandrian manuscripts. Again, both the Byzantine and the Alexandrian manuscripts are equal when it comes to ancientness. And it may very well be that the Alexandrian uh, people are using Byzantine manuscripts and just editing them and changing words according to their own philosophy. Um, the fourth answer, uh, these Alexandrian conflations are conflating Byzantine readings. And this is evidence that the Byzantine uh, manuscripts were down there in Alexandria. That is, if they're conflating Byzantine readings, then they have to have Byzantine manuscripts to do it. And uh, this is a logical and perfectly reasonable uh, uh, answer to this, uh, to this point, in that the Byzantine manuscripts are being edited by the Alexandrian. That is, the copies that are being sent down to Alexandria from Rome, from Corinth, from Ephesus, from Philippi, from uh, the seven churches uh, that John is writing to in Revelation, etc., are, uh, are being edited by the uh, Alexandrian uh, manuscripts. So that's, uh, that's conflation. Uh, the next point that we will look at is genealogy. So let's turn to that one next. 
Genealogy. The, the idea of genealogy can be found in Dr. White's King James Only Controversy, pages 70 to 74. In all of his uh, refutations of the King James Only, as Dr. White relies heavily upon the, the idea of text types, and text types is where we get, uh, genealogy is where we get the text types from uh, in his textual criticism. Uh, Dr. White will at times, though, um, chastise King James only as for using text types, uh, even though he himself uses uh, text types. Um, the answer to gen genealogy. Um, the first point is that the, this theory of genealogy was devised by Westcott and Hort in order to deny the validity of the Byzantine manuscripts. Uh, they never applied a genealogy to the manuscripts themselves. No one has ever applied genealogy to the manuscripts. They can't. There's only really one example of genealogy in all 5,700 manuscripts, and that is the, uh, the uh, association between P75 and Beta B, uh, the Vaticanus manuscript. Uh, that's the only example of, um, of uh, genealogy if there is genealogy in the in all 7,000 some odd manuscripts, or 5,000, sorry, 5,000 some odd manuscripts. And uh, that doesn't seem to argue well for genealogy, um, that, uh, that copies were made of the same manuscript is not disputed, that, uh, but uh, the argument that uh, these streams of copies uh, can be traced back to, let's say, Lucian of Antioch, or Hezekiah of Alexandria is just non-existent. There is no possible uh, connection between the so-called Alexandrian manuscripts and Hezekiah or the uh, Byzantine manuscripts in Lucian. The uh, second reason against uh, uh, genealogy, Lucian of Antioch and Hezekiah of Alexandria are said to be the collators of these two text types. And as I said, there is no scholarly evidence for this. None. Dr. White, if you can talk about genealogy, then show me. Show it to me. Show me how genealogy works in the text themselves. If uh, P52 can be shown to be Byzantine in nature, how does that show that it is Alexandrian uh, and any of the other manuscripts? Okay. Dr. White's answer number three. Dr. White's use of text types contradicts his statement here. I'm quoting from the King James Only controversy. Um, there was there were never there was never a time when any one or any group could gather up all the manuscripts and and make extensive changes to the text itself. Neither could someone gather up the texts and try to make them all say the same thing by harmonizing them. But that is exactly what genealogy is all about. It is about all these texts being harmonized back to uh, an exemplar, uh, and, uh, an original. And uh, that original is a copy of the autographs, or according to the theory. Um, but Dr. White says that there's, there couldn't have ever been a time when all the copies were gathered together, and Lucian of Antioch or Hezekiah of Alexandria or whoever you want to say, could have control over, you know, the manuscripts. Just, it's just not possible. Dr. White is in a contradiction here. And uh, the fifth, um, it goes on, uh, fourth answer. Mixture, the idea of mixture entirely destroys the idea of genealogy. That is, we find in the Alexandrian and in the, in the in the Western and in the Caesarean and in the Byzantine mixture. That is, there are Alexandrian readings in the Byzantine manuscripts. There are Byzantine readings in the Alexandrian manuscripts. So how can this be genealogy if this if mixture shows that uh, they're not they, they're not in the same stream, the same line, the same idea? The manuscripts of the New Testament so show such a varying degrees such varying degrees of loyalty to a text type that they cannot be rigidly classified. Right? Colwell says this. Streeter says this. Metzger says this. 
uh, men who are uh, familiar with the with the manuscripts are sympathetic to the critical text are all saying the same thing that genealogy just does not work on occasion dr white will admit this when he talks about streams of manuscripts right? in other words there are streams in his view and these streams uh, don't really aren't really connected they eventually connect themselves with someone but who it is i mean he doesn't really give us any information what texts show streams doctor oftentimes he will deny genealogy when he's debating king james only this by claiming that such is quote too simplistic which leads to error other times he upholds genealogy by claiming that there are alexandrian forms to the manuscript well if there are alexandrian forms and how is that too simplistic that which leads to error Answer five, there is no unified ancient or Alexandrian text type. And this is really the killer, both of the, uh, the idea of genealogy as well as the, the uh, modern textual critical view. Both the UBS and the critical text point this out by not having a symbol for the Alexandrian text type. The only so-called text type that can legitimately have a symbol in the apparatus of the UBS and the critical text is the majority, the Byzantine manuscripts, because they show unity. They show that they are derived from an exemplar, which would be the originals. That is, the churches which held the autographs, the ones that copied them, showing a line of manuscripts in the majority uh, text. This is, uh, I mean, the idea that the Alexandrian has a text type is completely refuted by their own text. Dr. White, show me in the critical text apparatus a symbol for the Alexandrian text type. What you're going to find is you're going to find the individual texts referred to. You're going to find Aleph and Beta, and Alexandrinitis, Alexandrinus, and Washingtonianus, and all of the other uh, great unseals of the uh, so-called Alexandrian text type. They're going to be individually listed. There's no, they, they don't agree with each other, and therefore, because they don't agree with each other, they can't be coming from one exemplar. There's no genealogy here. So that is the genealogy. The next, uh, the next point is the shorter readings. So let's go to that. Number four, the shorter readings are to be preferred. Uh, Brevior lectio potior. Uh, this is found in King James Only Controversy, verse, uh, pages 74 to 76. Uh, the argument is, is that because the Older manuscripts are more authoritative. The older manuscripts show a shorter reading, and therefore the shorter readings are to be preferred. Um, the answer to this, uh, consistent scholarship has shown that the longer readings are to be preferred and that the shorter readings are evidence of editing the text. This is uh, done by the work of Colwell, who argues uh, this very, very point. Um, the scholarly evidence against the shorter readings is a 1,000 page book uh, written by James Royce. In it, he examines P45, P46, P47, P66, P72, and P75, some of the most important so-called Alexandrian manuscripts. And he has shown that copyists are more likely to edit or shorten rather than lengthen a manuscript. Um, the Alexandrian uh, editors uh, edited these manuscripts. They actually had Byzantine longer readings in their possession. And Royce shows that they were editing the manuscripts uh, for one reason or another. It may be from mistake. It may be an actual intent. It may be according to their own philosophy. However, this idea that the shorter readings are to be preferred is wrong, and it has been ex refuted profoundly 
by uh, James Royce. Dr. White, you're going to have to answer these points and not simply think that, oh, my reputation as a reformed scholar is going to get you off on this, on these issues. Uh, how is Brevior Lectio Portior supposedly preferred above the longer readings? Um, it is pretty clear that when we exa that the examination of P45, P46, etc., has shown that uh, it is the longer readings that are to be preferred rather than the shorter. A copyist is more likely to skip over verses, lines, and uh, words uh, rather than uh, add words, lines, and things like that. So show the opposite, doctor, and be more than happy to look at it. So the next one we're going to look at is the Codex Sinaiticus. The Codex Sinaiticus. The finding of it you'll find in the King James Only Controversy, pages 56 to 59. And uh, this is an example of Dr. White using historical revisionism in order to prove his point. There are two theories as to the finding, and both are false. The King James Onlyist claims that it was a garbage text found in a garbage can. The text was actually found in a Geniza and was being transported to be burned. Now, the scribes and scholars in the uh, St. Catharines down in, the, uh, down in uh, the Sinai Peninsula there uh, like to burn their texts because uh, burning of the ancient manuscripts created a narcoleptic effect. There was a very pleasing odor involved, and it gave the uh, monastery a, a pleasing scent to it. So instead of burying the manuscripts, they, uh, they were burning them in order to uh, receive this nar narcoleptic effect. Um, the text, uh, this uh, burning or the burying of these manuscripts is a standard operating procedure concerning ancient texts. Uh, Dr. White picks up um, Tischendorf's uh, 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 statements and says that the texts were found in red cloths, and this is patently wrong. Uh, the text was found by uh, Tischendorf in an earlier expedition. I think it was around um, 1852 or so, and uh, he saw them in the in the garbage can, supposedly in the box that was about to be burned. And uh, he was too excited about them, and it turned out that the uh, they allowed him to copy about 50 pages or so, and uh, which he brought back with him but the rest they kept to themselves. And uh, during that time, uh, after that, he had a friend in Cairo who was trying to get, cop who was trying to get the copies, but uh, the scribes, the monks down in St. Catharines eventually said to him, we now understand the value of these manuscripts and we will not part with them uh, at all. And uh, I guess it was at that time that they uh, put the, the uh, text in red cloths and when Tischendorf uh, received the patronage of the Tsar of Russia, he came back down to uh, uh, the uh, St. Catharines and uh, was able to obtain a copy of them. Now, uh, not the copy, was able to obtain them. Now, the monks there claim that Tischendorf stole them, but uh, we don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, that's just hearsay. Um, so uh, when the when Tischendorf came back down in 18, I think it was 1859 or so, it was 1842 that he was there. It was about 17 years after uh, he first uh, saw the manuscripts in the basket. 17 years later, he came down and the monks brought the manuscripts out in red cloths. And that's where Dr. White picks up the, the argument. Um, his argument is an example of historical revisionism in that he does not at all mention the previous uh, visit by Tischendorf, but just simply says that the text was found in red cloths. And so if the thought that was a piece of garbage, then why would the, uh, why would the monks uh, put them in red cloths? Um, the reason is given in Tischendorf's account. Um, you can watch my video on that matter. 
Um, the answer to uh, the Codex Sinaiticus shows that it was tampered by Origen. Origen lived around 175 AD. I, I put a, a medium figure around that. Origen himself was a heretic, and he was not a Christian. He was, at best, a Gnostic. He is also notorious for having tampered with both the Old and New Testament texts. If you take out the Biblia Stuttgartensia, the Hebrew Old Testament, and you look in the in the apparatus of the, you'll see origin, origin, origin all over the place, uh, showing different readings in the. So origin was tampering with the Old Testament text, and uh, that he couldn't do it uh, shows that Doctor that um, that he couldn't he couldn't change the texts. Dr. White leads his readers to believe that the monks always prized Aleph, such as patently incorrect. Um, most probably Aleph was placed in a Geniza and was actually forgotten about. And when, when Tischendorf was down there, it was just the time for them to burn that manuscript. And so, uh, so that's how Tischendorf got uh, involved with it. Answer three, Codex Sinaiticus has about 14,000 alterations about 10,800 errors, omissions, and corrections to the text. This indicates a very sloppily copied text. Thus, it is not accurate to the originals, nor should it be considered reliable. Dr. White claims that this is evidence of the great use over the last 1,400 years, but if the text was so well used, then it would have disintegrated a long time ago, along with the autographs. According to the British Museum, of whom they actually own the manuscripts. The latest editor lived around the 7th century, about 300, 200, 300 years after the manuscript was executed. Um, a final note concerning Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, this, um, they, the first eight chapters of the book of John in the Codex Sinaiticus are identified by modern textual critics as being Western in nature. If this is the case, then that pushes the Sinaiticus text at least a hundred years after its original, the date that it is right now assigned to. Um, instead of the fourth century, it should be considered a fifth century manuscript, which would not make it the oldest manuscript, the oldest almost complete manuscript uh, that we have. But that is a supposition again. Um, textual scholars have noted that uh, the first eight chapters of the book of John in the Sinaiticus text is Western in nature. Now, whether or not that pushes the, uh, the dating of it further is a matter of uh, conjecture. So that's the Sinaiticus text. The next, uh, the next point we're going to look at is the harder reading. The harder reading is to be preferred. This is found in uh, Dr. White's King James Only Controversy book, pages 248 to 252. Um, answer one, the unspoken assumption is that the biblical writers wanted to make the text more obscure for their readers. And this is simply not true. Um, the biblical writers were very careful as to try to make as clear as possible with their writings. Now, Peter says that Paul's writings do have some difficulties in them, but uh, they are not purposeful uh, difficulties. And the uh, type of harder readings that is referred here just don't work. Um, the overwhelming uh, answer to the overwhelming external evidence for the easier reading of Luke 4.44 proves the TR reading is correct. Um, the majority of the manuscripts of Luke uh, attest to the TR reading. The overwhelming internal evidence for Luke 4.44 proves that the TR reading is correct. So we have both external as well as internal evidence that the uh, uh, the, the reading at Luke 4.44 is correct in the TR, or the King James Version, if you want to look it up. If the harder reading is retained, then it creates a factual error in the Bible. Jesus was never in Judah at that time. This was his Galilean ministry, 
and he was in Galilee. He was not in Judah. Um, it also creates a real contradiction in that Luke 4.44 says that Jesus was in Judah, and yet Mark 1.39 says that Jesus was in Galilee. Now, the argument uh, that they try to say is that Judah includes Galilee at the time. But again, that is not factually correct either. Both Judah and Galilee were part of Herod's uh, kingdom, Herod the Great's kingdom. But once Herod the Great died, he divided it up into three parts to his three uh, sons, Archelaus and, uh, and his other two sons. And uh, because of this, because uh, Herod was, his son Herod was king of Judah, when uh, Mary and Joseph and Jesus came back into Israel, they didn't stay in Bethlehem. They went up into Nazareth, into Galilee. And again, there's a distinction in the Bible between Judah and Galilee that is uh, just not correct when it comes, when, uh, when uh, modern textual critic historians try to say that. The Bible is not factually in error, nor does it contradict itself. The TR reading is the best attested reading. It is factually correct, and it is non-contradictory. And it also is upheld by the majority of manuscripts. It is upheld by many of the Alexandrian, the older manuscripts. And uh, it is consistent with, the, the, uh, um, with Reformed theology in regards to Scripture interpreting Scripture. Um, answer three. In like fashion, John 1.18 is best attested both externally, that is the majority of manuscripts, as well as some ancient Alexandrian manuscripts. I'm just using the modern textual views here. These aren't my views. I'm just using their views to, contra to show that they, they are not correct. This, uh, it, it is best attested externally, that is monogenes huiu, including some important Alexandrian manuscripts, as well as internally, the analogy of scripture. That is, that the monogenes huiu is the Johannine uh, comment. It's whenever monogenes is used, it's used in regards to a child, a person. It is not used in regards to God. Monogenes theu is an error that the Alexandrians uh, put in and was later corrected by the Byzantine manuscripts. So internal and external evidence for the re TR reading of both Luke 4.44 and John 1.18 is overwhelming. It's so overwhelming that uh, they have to produce these this harder reading in order to prove the, uh, the, uh, the reading, uh, in order to prove their reading and change the manuscripts. Um, the final uh, point that we'll make is the early church fathers. So we'll go to that now. The early church fathers, especially Athanasius of Alexandria. Dr. White says that Athanasius cites Alexandrian readings. I have a copy of uh, Athanasius's On the Incarnation, and both uh, the English as well as the Greek. And the first five citations that I could find in the book all cite Byzantine readings. Um, Dean, answer one to this, Dean John Bergen combed the writings of the early church fathers and has shown that they cite mostly Byzantine readings, including Athanasius. Now, when you consider that the early church fathers were not citing exactly uh, texts, that I think mostly from memory, it would show that their memory showed Byzantine readings. They must have been very familiar with these readings in order to cite them. Um, Edward Hills uh, also combed the critical copies of the early church fathers, uh, basically because uh, Bergen was, uh, they argued that Bergen wasn't using critical texts. So Hills uh, revisited Bergen's work in looking at using critical texts, and he found the same thing, and has shown that they mostly cite Byzantine readings, including Athanasius of Alexandria, is citing Byzantine manuscripts. 
Uh, recently, Jack Mormon, J.A. Mormon, who is a King James onlyist, has combed the critical editions of the early church fathers and has shown that they mostly cite Byzantine readings. Now, he might just be regurgitating the work of Hills and Bergen. I don't know. You would have to ask him about that. But he has a book out called Early Manuscripts, Church Fathers, and the Authorized Version. And in it, he shows uh, the early father's citation of Byzantine readings. So the whole argument that the, the early church fathers uh, were, uh, were Alexandrian in nature is just totally incorrect. Also, in my first video, I pointed out that uh, Gunther Zuntz says that even if we didn't have P45, P46, uh, or P66, which all attest to Byzantine manuscripts, we could reconstruct the Byzantine manuscripts simply from the early church fathers' quotations of them. So uh, the idea that um, the Byzantine manuscripts were not there from the beginning is absurd. The churches in the area were copying manuscripts and those manuscripts turn out to be the Byzantine manuscripts. And um, those are the ones, those are the churches that had the originals and those are the ones that are turning out copies and those copies that we have today are Byzantine. The only evidence for Alexandrian readings is found in Alexandria, Egypt, in Egypt and Oxyrhynchus as well. But that's all. I mean, there's no example of Alexandrian manuscripts in in Rome or, well, yeah, there is, I mean, uh, Vaticanus, but that was brought there. And so the whole idea that um, the Alexandrian manuscripts are to be preferred because they are older is just, just incorrect. <clears throat> the conclusion, the critical text philosophy utilized by Dr. James White has no basis in history, reality, nor is defensible from a biblical, theological, and philosophical standpoint. It is completely and entirely refuted, not only by King James Onlyists or by um, text, Textus Receptus uh, people and uh, Byzantine priorities such as majority text, but it's also these points are refuted by their own people, by critical scholars who are honest and looking at the manuscripts and are saying that this philosophy is draw ray. That is, it is the dogmatic repetition of already refuted errors. So there's the forest for the trees. We have looked at a lot or most of Dr. White's presentation in his book the King James Only Controversy. And I have shown you that Dr. White is not standing on reformed views. None of these points are defensible from a reformed perspective. None of them are. Um, from the most, from the radical understanding that, uh, that the older manuscripts are the most authoritative to all of these radical points, shorter reading, the genealogy, everything, is refuted, not simply by Reform scholars or uh, King James Onlyists or um, men like Bergen and, and Scrivener, uh, but by their own people. I mean, if, if Dr. Metzger and Dr. Zunz and Colwell, Dr. Colwell and Skeeter and uh, uh, Streeter and uh, many others are going to say that these, these thoughts have no basis in reality in what the texts are actually showing us, then why is Dr. White trying to resurrect a theory that has been completely and utterly refuted already? Um, that is something that Dr. White is going to have to answer. And uh, I, so because this is a false philosophy and I have shown it to be a false philosophy, I would be more than happy to uh, debate with Dr. White on these points. Dr. White, if you want to debate, we can debate these points. 
We can debate any one of them or all of them. Uh, we can take a look at your book and we can debate that, the principles that are laid within there. But the thing is, whenever I see you doing textual criticism, I never see you using reformed principles. You're always using one or another of these. And on pages 321 to 323, I think, um, of your book, uh, The King James Only Controversy, where you talk about uh, 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 John 1.18, there's nothing there about uh, that, cons that is reformed or is based on reformed principles. It's the older manuscripts which carry the more weight with you. And in that presentation on John 1.18, you don't even show the overwhelming textual evidence for monogenes huiu. And uh, because of that, uh, you don't show the uh, Alexandrian manuscripts, which are older, that show the, uh, that, that, that uh, have monogenes huiu in it. So it's an old reading. You don't show the early church fathers who, sh who, who show that, who look at that. I don't have the information right in front of me, but you know, I'll provide it for anyone who wants to take a look at it. You don't show the other side. All you show is your side. Then you show uh, what is a uh, ho monogenes, uh, but you don't even talk about uh, monogenes huiu and uh, the manuscripts that back that. So I mean, your your whole presentation at that point is is purely um, disingenuous, and uh, it is inconsistent with a godly man. That I, uh, the godliness that I would expect of you, and um, I, I just completely reject your under your view of uh, first uh, of John one eighteen based on taking a look at both sides of the issue. So anyway, um, thank you very much for watching this video. Um, I'm going to go into the next part in this video, so you can you can stay on. I'm not going to stop it, but uh, we've gone on quite a long time. And I appreciate you uh, staying with me. So in the next segment, we're going to look at reformed principles of textual criticism. So let's take a look. Okay, the principles of reformed textual criticism come from the Reformation, obviously, and especially come from the Bible itself. And so we have to establish what is the authority upon which textual criticism is going to be based upon. As I mentioned earlier in this video, the authority of modern textual critics is man, is man's rational capacity in a scientific uh, endeavor to find the truth. And from that comes Westcott and Hort, and from that comes Dr. White's uh, book, The King James Only Controversy. Um, in it, you will not find Dr. White saying that the ultimate authority for textual criticism is God himself. He does not say it in this book. And that is because <clears throat> he is being influenced by a false philosophy, as I mentioned earlier. There is no mention here in, the, in his book concerning the ultimate authority being God himself. The authority upon which Dr. White depends upon is scholarship, is man, and is essentially the principles that I laid out in the, earlier in this video. And that is what's causing me concern concerning Dr. White and Dr. Wallace and Dr. Carson. These men are eminently uh, reformed men, and they believe in the ultimate authority of God. I, I think that that is the case. I believe that that is the case. However, when it comes to textual criticism, the ultimate authority is not God himself, but the older manuscripts. This is most evidently set forth in Dr. White's book on, I believe it's page 320, 323, where he talks about, um, yeah, it's page 323,
where he talks, talks about uh, John 1.18. Now, he makes a good presentation of the Trinity, but uh, what is his ultimate authority? Um, his ultimate authority is the older manuscripts. It's uh, P66, uh, Aleph, Beta, uh, the C text, L, Syriac, the Syriac version, uh, Origin. It's man is the ultimate authority that he is appealing to uh, for his textual criticism. So let's take a look at what the Westminster Confession of Faith says concerning ultimate authorities. So the first principle of Reformed textual criticism is that the authority of Scripture, and I think that underlies all of the principles of, um, of Reformed textual criticism, especially the, uh, the next one, which we're going to look at, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, the testimony of the Spirit of God. And the, the authority of, of Scripture being God Himself and the testimony of the Spirit of God are very, very close. I could almost say that they are the same in a, in a, in a matter of speaking. But uh, they are, there is a difference there in that the scripture is authoritative in and of itself. It is self-attesting. And uh, what attests to the scripture is the Spirit of God, which works with the Word of God. And that is the second point in Reformed textual criticism, which I will put up right now. Oh, um, by the way, I am quoting both the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, because Dr. White holds the Second London Baptist, and essentially they say the same thing. Second London Baptist is essentially a copy of the Westminster Confession, except in certain areas such as baptism and church government, I think. But anyway, here's, uh, here's what the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist say concerning the witness of the Spirit of God. So the Westminster, Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith both agree that, it, that the Word of God is not established by the testimony of the church, whether it's the heavenliness of the matter or how beautiful the, uh, the words are or the efficacy of the doctrine or any of the other incomparable excellencies. Uh, these can be used to induce somebody to believe the scriptures. But according to both the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession, what uh, uh, the principle that, that should uh, undergird our um, textual criticism is that it is the Spirit of God who works by and with the Word in our hearts. And so if we have a question as to whether or not a verse is, uh, is legitimate or not, we should ask God because it's God's Word, and that is, uh, that is fundamental, I believe, to it. We pray, and what we do is you, you take away all your, pre, uh, your prejudices concerning a verse. For instance, look at 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Take away all your prejudices, read 1 John 5, 7, and 8, and then ask God, is this the Word? And I believe that God will work in your heart and even in your heart, Dr. White, even though you are immensely prejudiced against it. And I will, in actually my next video, I will, I will deal with 1 John 5, 7, and 8. But anyway, that is how the, the God works. He works through His Word and teaches us that the pericope adultere is the Word of God. That the last 12 verses of Mark is the Word of God. That 1 John 5, 7 is the Word of God. Now, the problem, and the biggest problem is, is that Dr. White, I, I know he intellectually believes this, but it doesn't enter into his textual criticism. It's not there. You read his book, 
and you're not going to find that it is the Spirit of God that witnesses with the Word of God, that teaches us that this is the Word of God. It's not here in the book. Now, I have looked hard, and maybe I've missed a part or something like that. So, I mean, doctor, you can show me, or a, a good friend of yours can show me where it is that you are actually saying that this is the principle by which I am affecting textual criticism. But when I look at your exegesis of passages, such as uh, John 1.18 or the Johannine comma, I don't see this. I see you using this, these principles that I have just talked about, principles that you have laid down in your book. And uh, those are human principles. Now, what I'd like to do right now is play a video clip that really shows Dr. White's mentality in this matter. And uh, I hope I can play the video clip if I can download it from YouTube. But if I can't, I'll use the I'll do the audio and I'll try to put the words up on the audio. Um, so let's take a look at a clip from Dr. White from one of Dr. White's presentations. Is something I feel very strongly about. Um, I take the Reformed Baptist belief in the inerrancy of Scripture into battle around the world. Um, and there's a big difference when you do that than the theory in the, in the nice quiet of the study. Um, what might work real well in the study doesn't work in front of Bart Ehrman or John Dominic Crossan or Marcus Borg um, or Shabir Ali uh, or all my Muslim friends. Uh, it's real easy to, you know, armchair quarterback things, but um, I have to take this stuff into the into the battle place of ideas. Um, and the clip that you just saw was a uh, recent um, exposition by Dr. White on the, the Johannine comma or the comma Johannium, however you want to however you want to say it. And uh, what troubles me is that here, Dr. White's apologetic. He's saying, I have to, I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And that's great. I think it's great that he is and promoting the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, again, inerrancy is not inspiration, but leave that at another, at another point. Um, he believes in the inerrancy, the, the Baptist view of the inerrancy of Scripture. And uh, he has to take this throughout the whole world, uh, debating unbelievers, essentially. I mean, the people he mentions, Bart Ehrman, Shabir Ali, uh, others, Mormons, whoever. Um, he's debating with unbelievers concerning this matter. And what he seems to be saying, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, and I'm willing to be um, corrected on this, is that Bart Ehrman, Shabir Ali, uh, all these unbelievers are the ones who are determining his apologetic. That is, you know, I have to talk with these people and I have to present uh, these things and I have to present them in a way that, uh, that Shabir Ali, Bart Ehrman will accept. Um, I don't think that your audience should be the determining factor concerning your textual criticism. I mean, in one sense, I, I can understand that, in that you want to present the, the gospel to people who don't believe and to do so in a way that is um, entertaining for them. But when it becomes, when the, your audience becomes the determiner of your textual critical decisions and you, you base your textual critical decisions on a rationalistic understanding of scripture. For instance, um, Dr. Ehrman is not going to accept the points concerning reform textual criticism that I just pointed out. He's an unbeliever. He's blind. Shabir Ali is the same way. He's blind. They will not accept the idea of the Spirit of God working with the Word of God. And in another interview that you did with Stephen Anderson, you point this out as well. You say, well, you know, everybody has their own, you know, opinion of what the Spirit of God says. The Mormons have one opinion. Um, I have one opinion. You have one opinion. You're talking to Stephen uh, Anderson. And, um, you know, it's just like, it's this whole, you know, if you open up this thing, you're opening up a can of worms, you know, people are subjectively uh, being, uh, being uh, convicted of what the Word of God is. 
And uh, that's the same argument that uh, was used by the Roman Catholics against the Protestants when the Protestants wanted to print the Bible in the vulgar languages. When Luther printed in German, you know, the Catholics were saying, well, now you've put the Word of God in the hands of everybody, and therefore they're going to, you're going to have thousands and difference, and everybody's going to have arguments and, and, and uh, dissensions on that matter. Um, it's the same kind of argument that you're making, Dr. White that the Roman Catholics made uh, against Luther when Luther translated the Bible into German. But, so I don't see the relevance of your, your point. Um, what we should be doing is we should be standing on the Bible as the Word of God. We don't say, well, you know, I can determine the Word of God through this rationalistic process and therefore convince you that the Bible is the Word of God. And uh, I'm just not buying that, and I don't think it's right. Um, Dr. Ehrman is not going to accept the idea that it is the Spirit of God that works with the Word of God, probably because he doesn't believe that God exists. But, uh, you know, again, that's a supposition. Maybe he does believe that God exists. Um, I don't know if he believes that Jesus is God. But, um, but, uh, you know, the point is, is that he's a skeptic, and he's a rationalist. And the, uh, the things of the Spirit of God are not the, uh, are, are foolishness to the Greek, the Bible says. And uh, the Greek, in that sense, is one who holds to a rational understanding. The Greek philosophy, um, coming from Plato, Aristotle, held to a rationalistic philosophy. And the foolishness of the Bible, the preaching of the Word, the Word of God itself, is foolishness to the Greek. And these people need to be preached to. They need to be taught the Word of God. And that what they are reading is the Word of God, not some thing determined by a, a long list of um, rather boring uh, points made by, from a rationalistic philosophy. So uh, I'm concerned, Dr. White, um, about your answer here and uh, in this clip concerning the Johannine comma. And again, I will be answering that clip as well as your presentation in your book uh, in, a, in my next video, actually. And, uh, but uh, no doubt you're going to want to debate me on that, or no doubt you'll take me apart in that text. But if you want to debate, I will debate these principles that you have produced in your book. If you want to stand by them, fine. Um, but the thing is, you're not consistently reformed when it comes to textual criticism. And this is what I'm pointing out. Now, the next point of uh, reformed textual criticism we will get into right now. I am quoting both the Westminster Confession and the London Baptist Confession because I want to cover the whole spectrum of Reformed theology. And uh, these two confessions are practically identical to each other, especially when it comes to the uh, scriptures in chapter one of each of the respective confessions. Um, in this part of the Confession of Faith, um, the Westminster or the ba London Baptist, whichever you like to look at, we see two things. <clears throat> the first part is, it is that it is the Hebrew and the Greek texts, the, the, the original Hebrew and the original Greek, which we are to look at. Um, and uh, those are the important aspects of the, uh, of textual criticism. Now, um, B.B. Warfield was the first one to interpret this, pass this particular passage uh, uh, of the Westminster Confession of Faith to say that the original autographs only are inspired. And thus ins he places inspiration way beyond the ability of anyone to touch because we don't have the original autographs anymore. And uh, consequently he preserved, if you want to put it that way, the idea of inspiration 
in the autographs, but uh, he's essentially saying then that the copies that we have today are not inspired. Uh, we cannot we cannot get the copies, and I'm using the plural here. We cannot get the uh, autographs from the copies that we have today. And that is not at all what the reading of the Westminster Confession of Faith is saying. The Westminster Confession of Faith is saying that the original autographs were inspired and that the copies that we have today, as Bart Ehrman likes to say, we don't have the autographs anymore, but we have copies and copies and copies and copies and copies, have been preserved throughout all the ages, all the way down today, in all of the copies, in Hebrew and the Greek copies, uh, that we have. And because of that, uh, we can reconstruct the original autographs word for word. It's very, it's very easily, it can be easily done. When you read, for instance, um, in Wallace and his book on um, the corruption of the text, <clears throat> or when you listen to Dr. White talk about the corruptions in the, in the uh, text, you'll see that it's, oh, they can easily spot the differences. Uh, for instance, the spelling differences are easily spotted. Um, the, all the different variants that occur that affect the, uh, the, the, the Bible and Bible doctrine is how they put it, um, can be spotted, can be easily spotted. All these differences can be spotted and weeded out to the point that you can come to the original autographs through the copies that we have today. Now, I believe that the closest that we have come to the original autographs is Stephen's 1550. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm producing these videos to show that the Texas Receptus is the preserved Word of God. Now, the Texas Receptus is a printed edition. It is not the manuscripts that we have today. And when we talk about the Greek texts, we must include the printed editions as well. Partly because um, we don't have all of the texts that Stevens or even Erasmus uh, had at their time. Um, the Great Fire in London destroyed the, uh, the British Library and burned many of the books that were involved with the, uh, the text. But uh, that's for another uh, look. Um, what we have today <clears throat> and what the Westminster Confession of Faith is saying is that it is the Greek and the Hebrew texts that are important. Not the translations such as the King James Version. It, it doesn't say that the King James is, uh, is inspired or authentic. It is saying that the Hebrew and the Greek texts, the original autographs and their copies the copies made from the original autographs in the original languages are the copies that uh, we are to use in our textual criticism. And the second point that is pointed out here is that these copies have been preserved, that they are authentic, um, and therefore we are to use them in all matters concerning faith and life. And uh, <clears throat> the Westminster divines would not say that if they didn't believe that the copies that they had in their hands uh, back in the 1600s were the authentic copies of the original autographs. Um, with B.B. Warfield, a change has been made. The original autographs only are the inspired, and what we have today are, you know, we, we just can't really come to a, 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 a real decision as to whether or not what the readings of the original autographs were. Now, Bart Ehrman picks this up as well. He says, well, we don't have the original autographs. We don't even have copies of the copies of the copies of the copies. We have copies way down the line, and therefore we can't really know what the original autographs were. Um, this is an um, argument from unbelief. Um, if you don't believe that God inspired the original autographs, then you're not going to believe that uh, God could preserve these autographs through all history in the multitude of copies that we have today. Um, let's take a look, for instance, in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, 
who were the priests in the Old Testament? It was the Aaronic priesthood. And they were given the uh, <clears throat> responsibility to transmit the scriptures. And they did. And we have, uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament, virtually everything that Moses and the prophets and, uh, and, and the wisdom writers, all of them wrote, word for word. They did a very good job. In the New Testament, the priesthood has changed. It has changed. The Aaronic priesthood has been done away with, and now it's the priesthood of all believers. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility. It is the responsibility of all Christians to make sure that the Word of God is being preserved for the next generation, and that following generation, etc., etc. And that was what was done throughout all the ages. The churches in the Byzantine Empire, well what would later be called the Byzantine Empire, were copying and copying and doing uh, good textual criticism work by copying the manuscripts. And these manuscripts came down to us through all the ages into the Reformation. And Erasmus and Stephanus and the Elsevier brothers um, collated these manuscripts and uh, received them and uh, created the uh, closest that we have today of, um, to the autographs in the Texas Receptus. And I believe that's Stephen's 1550, or if you want, 1551, which has the, verse, uh, the verses in them, uh, is, or it, it is, the, uh, the authentic uh, copies of the autographs and um, these uh, new translation well, new translation this new text the critical text is a product of a false philosophy um, so that's uh, that's the that's the next um, principle of reformed textual criticism the first being the Holy Spirit <clears throat> witnessing by and with the Word of God the second principle is the, um, is the uh, Hebrew and the Greek texts. And the third principle is the preservation of those Hebrew and Greek texts that come down to us today. And that's really what, our, what textual criticism is all about, is receiving the Word of God through the ages, handed down to us from uh, ancient times, and producing a, uh, a, the text uh, the, the authentic text for the next generations to come. So let's take a look at the next uh, principle of Reformed textual criticism. Okay, <clears throat> the last principle of Reformed textual criticism that I will go over today is what is spoken about here in uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, often called the analogy of faith, the analogia fidei. Um, what it means is that the scripture interprets the scripture. And so if you have a problem, if there is a problem in the text, you are to search it out in other passages and see whether or not the, the, the reading is correct. Um, and so I believe that the, that the analogia fidei, the analogy of faith, is a very important aspect to um, textual criticism. Because when we come to a problem in the text, okay, we can take a look at what the context of the passage says how the writer himself, whether it's John or Paul or Peter, would actually use the words and uh, look at other passages in Scripture that say the same thing. And uh, a good example of that would be in the past would be Luke 4.44 when you compare it to Mark 1.39. Now there's a textual problem in Luke 4.44. There is no textual problem at Mark 1.39. So uh, when we take a look at it, we see that the majority of the uh, manuscripts are in line with uh, the Texas Receptus.
that there are even ancient manuscripts in the quote Alexandrian tradition that hold to the uh, Texas Receptus view. And uh, that there are an abundant of uh, early church fathers and, uh, and later on church fathers who have um, quoted from these passages. And then when we take a look at the Analogia Fidei and we compare Luke 44:44 with Mark 1:39, we can come to an absolute uh, agreement that uh, Luke 4:44 is is the original reading found in the Textus Receptus. Um, and the fact that there are a handful of manuscripts that uh, that uh, hold to another position um, simply simply points out that uh, the passage was redacted by Alexandrian scribes and uh, some of the early church fathers did it. But the overwhelming majority of early church fathers, when you take a look at the Greek texts that uh, in the previous principle, when you take a look at the copies, uh, when you ask yourself whether or not this is truly the Word of God or not, I believe that God will teach you that that's the case. So, um, the final overview uh, of a Reformed textual criticism, and I will end the video at this point, at that point, once I finish. Um, the first principle would be God is the one who's in authority, and that's covers, that's like uh, the background that covers all of the principles that we see. It is God who's in authority over his word, it is not man. Um, the second principle, which goes right along with that, is that it is the Spirit of God that works with the Word of God that teaches both you and me that what we are reading is the Word of God. Um, the third principle is that God inspired His Word in the Hebrew and in the Greek, uh, Hebrew and the Chalde, uh, and, the, and the Greek. Um, and so it is to the Hebrew and the Greek that we are to look for. Now under this, under these it would be the early church fathers, the lectionaries, and, uh, and other things. But those are subcategories of the, of the Hebrew and the Greek. The Hebrew and the Greek are the major ones. If a passage is not found in the Hebrew and the Greek, then it should not be considered as part of the Word of God. Um, and after that, it would be the copies. The copies that were made that we have today are the ones that contain the original uh, autographs in them. And thus the copies that we have today are have the infallible autographs. And the Textus Receptus being the received text from the ancient uh, times, uh, from the copies being made in the Byzantine tradition, um, is the closest that we have today to the autographs. And that is the text that we should be using, whether it's 1550 or 1551. And finally, um, the uh, Analogia Fidei, the Analogy of Faith, is what is, uh, is a, an important principle in textual criticism. When we have problems, we are to look at the Word of God in its context, in its uh, greater context, in the book by itself, in its, and, and uh, in, in other passages in Scripture that speak more clearly. So that, that is the Reformed textual criticism that I will be applying, for instance, to the Kama Johannium, or the Johanni Kama, however you want to put it, uh, which will be in our next, my next video, will be on the Kama Johannium. And uh, until then, may God richly bless you, and I hope that these videos are of help. And uh, again, I don't wish to be mean to Dr. White, but it, this is essentially a call and a handshake over the internet for him to repent of these uh, of this uh, modern textual criticism and to come into the fold of reformed textual criticism. May God bless you and keep you in all things, in Christ, and this video is for Christ and Christ alone.